Hi, David Ellenstein here, Artistic Director of North Coast Repertory Theater. Thank you for tuning in today to our theater conversations. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. That would help us out a lot. Thank you. Hi, it is my great pleasure today to uh, be joined on Theater Conversations by the amazing actor Lawrence Luckinbill, who uh, we're lucky enough at North Coast to have had come and do his one-person plays. Um, he did um, Teddy Roosevelt. Lyndon Johnson and Clarence Darrow. And Clarence Darrow and Lyndon Johnson, um, which he's done all over the country for many, many years. Hi, Larry, how are you? Hello, David, how are you? I'm, I'm okay, we're, we're all bearing we up. Here we are maskless. Maskless, well, you know what, I'm not, your, I, your germs are gonna have trouble getting to me right here. Well, uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to start off this conversation as you've had an amazing career uh, that has spanned, you know, Broadway and regional theater and television and film. And I mean, just a, a wide breadth, you've done it, you've done it all essentially. Um, and I just want to know how you, you got into it with. Let me read you okay, something. Okay, I'm ready. You know, I'm, I'm writing this, I'm editing the memoir oh. that I have that I have spent uh, the last three years compiling and 1,300 pages. Wow. And, and I'm going to cut it down to 300. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to cut it down to maybe five. You know, I, Christopher Plummer's, Plummer's uh, autobiography was 600 pages and most of it was and then I met Laurence Olivier and we, we performed and then we went to the pub, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he's a sweet guy, but you know, it was pretty much that. Mine has been all over the place, all over the world. But let me read you this. This is the thing that we've, I've decided will be the introduction on okay, that, great. that little page. And, uh, and then I'll tell you the title of the, of the book. Okay, great. How, how does a cracker kid from Arkansas transform into an actor. We all long to matter, to stand tall, to reach for something higher and something finer than we are, to be worthy, to find real love. In my case, it was a life course in making a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> the title of this, this opus is, is, uh, is called uh, famous enough. Okay, there we go. There. Well, okay. it was a pretty good sow's ear to start with, right? Yeah. You, you got to start with a good sow's ear first. I guess so. <laughs> uh, yeah. Does that sound too denigrating, self self no. denigrating? No, I'm just trying to be clever and not succeeding. Yeah. Well, you know, if you have a good sow, of course, in Arkansas, where I grew up, we have uh, the Razorbacks. Right. So, you know, they're not nice. They're mean. So, so what got you into theater as a kid? I mean, what, what was, was, was there a, uh, something in school or? Yeah, it was, it was, something? it was uh, actually not liking school. And so I was a, uh, I became the class clown. I was a slacker really, uh, because I really hated school. And uh, even though I am a reader, I've been reading since I was seven years old, I remember my auntie gave me uh, my first book when I was seven on my first communion day. And she happened to be the oldest, my, my mother's oldest sister. And uh, she, she and my mother didn't get along. But, uh, and she seemed to think that, that we were all wild Indians in, in my house. And she didn't like that at all. And I don't think she liked me but she gave me this wonderful book. And I've always wondered why, but it was, I didn't know that I needed glasses, but I was always squinting at something. And anyway, I opened this book and it was the greatest experience of my entire life. And that includes all the acting and everything else because it was my book and it was big and thick and heavy and the pages were beautiful. And, it was the adventures of Robin Hood. Oh yeah, and it had the illustrations by Howard Pyle, and uh, or uh, it was 
a stunning, a stunning experience for me. I smelled that book, I tasted it, I slept with it, I took it to school, I kept it next to me at, at, in bed at night, and I ate that book alive. And, and I realized that there was something going on in me that was very different from anything in my family, because my family were blue collar workers, we were poor, uh, it was the depression. Uh, by the time I got this book, it was the early days of World War II. And uh, I had to put it by, by the windowsill where the light was so that I could actually read it because I was so nearsighted. And so to go into a place of the imagination was where I always was, it seemed like. And I would be drifting along in school and dreaming and ma making smart ass remarks that uh, made the, the kids like, you know, laugh. But, uh, but uh, it was a difficult time for me. So the fact that I could uh, entertain people, I think, in that way, led me willy nilly into a direction that I never would have dreamed of, which was walking on a stage. Yeah. When there was, when in Arkansas, there was no theater. Uh, in my grade school, some uh, a, a wonderful company came, all, all rouged up and lots of periwigs, called the Claire Tree Major Players. Now I don't know who Claire Tree Major was, or if she was a major, <laughs> or like Major Barbara, or what. But anyway, uh, they did fairy tales in, in grade school, and I thought, wow, who are these people? They were like some, I'd never seen such a thing. And then of course the movies, you know, my, my, my little town had movie theaters. And I saw, I discovered that uh, I could go into there, those places and disappear from myself and from the life that I was living, which was, um, I, I can't, you know, I grew up in the South and the South was racist and the South was, there was a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of covered personalities running things, not unlike today. And uh, so uh, I could perceive those things and I was different. And uh, so, but I had no dream whatever of being in the, in the theater or being an actor, none, whatever. I started out to, uh, to, uh, to, be in, uh, to, to be a doctor because my mother said, you be a doctor because you got to, get somewhere in life yeah so, so who are your who are your mentors along the way that got you actually on the track of well it's odd because you think of a mentor as someone friendly to you but many of my mentors have been people who slapped the shit out of me you know and said change change caroline <laughs> you know be different be better uh when i was in uh in the last year of high school I was going to summer school, of course, to make up things. And uh, I was being taught by the Sisters of Mercy, or the Sisters of No Mercy, as we like to call them. And uh, this English teacher, uh, Sister Matthew, gave me this assignment to read. I don't know, I, I still don't remember. It was Yeats or, 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 or whoever, Keats, somebody. Uh, to maybe to a, star, a skylark or one of those things, and I just slacked it off. I was like, "What is this crap?" You know. And there were like six of us in the class, and we knew each other very well. We we're like, "Hey, <laughs> you know, those kind of guys." You know, you've seen them, and I was one of them. Anyway, she she said, "Okay, read your assignment, uh, Mr. Leckenbill," and I I blew it off in in a way that made some lady chuckle. And she didn't do anything except walk toward me and give me an Irish right cross that knocked me out of my chair. She slapped the crap out of me and I fell on the floor and I was laughing. It hurt, but I was laughing. And she looked at me and she said, the words of poets are very important. If you don't know how to communicate in your own language, you're not going to amount to anything. It will be nothing. And she walked away, smile. And in her eyes, there was a little Irish twinkle because she liked me. And I thought, what the hell? What am I doing? 
and the last part of my high school, I got to write for the local high school paper. And all of a sudden, that opened up a place. I, I can do something. I can, I, like, I can do something with words. Yeah. And so, you know, all my life I wanted to, to write, and I have been writing all my life. But the, the first time I really got on the stage was in, when I went to, when I, after I failed, every course in pre-med, every single course, and I failed some of them twice. Um, I, it's a long story and a funny story, but I, uh, I had to go home and tell my parents that I was not going to be a doctor. And so we took aptitude tests, if you remember them. Sure. And they told me that I belonged in the performing arts. What? You know, that was so strange to me. I, I was shocking. I shocked my mother. And on the way back home on the bus, I noticed that she was clutching her purse and white knuckling it. And I said, Mom, what's the, what's the matter? Because I failed the aptitude test. I, I belonged in the performing arts. And uh, that meant death to her. Anyway, I said, what's wrong, Mom? And she said, Larry, you have just got to have a chance. You've got to have a chance, Larry. And she started to cry. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be in the performing arts, whatever the hell that is, I knew what it was, but I, I didn't see myself there. So I went back to the university, the University of Arkansas, which was a blue island in a sea of red. And... Uh, and uh, I signed up for every single course, and I had only two years to finish them. And I suddenly was getting A's. Suddenly I was running to class. Suddenly I was free. And I remembered when I was nine years old, David, I stood on the highest place I could find in our house and get to, which was on our back porch, which was quite high, our little wooden house. And my sister was down below, and I said, I'm going to fly now. <laughs> and my sister looked up at me <laughs> like she was scared. And I had pinned a towel to my T-shirt, and I said, my towel is ready. It's going to bloom out behind me like Captain Marvel, and I'm going to jump off this thing, and I'm going to... I'm going to level off horizontally and I'm going to fly to the alley. Now you watch. And uh, when she was 78 years old and I was 84, I said, Lynn, do you remember that? She says, yes, I remember that. And I thought you were crazy, but I thought you were brave too. Right. And she said, I thought if he can do it, so can I. Right. I stepped out, I fell. I was on a, I had a walking stick for a week. And of course, but it wasn't the last of my attempts to fly. I'm still trying to fly. Here we go. That's such a good analogy for an actor, someone who's, you know, brave and courageous and willing to jump off that railing, you know? Yes. And every time you, every time they call places. Yeah. And you know? I do. And the feeling. I hear it. So you you have had lots of great. You were in the original Boys in the Band. You were in Chapter Two on Broadway. You were in a bunch of movies, including playing Spock's brother later on, and all kinds of stuff. Which things like made the biggest um, difference for you as an actor or a person, or even in your career? What, when I when I ask you this question, what what what, what do you think of? I think of uh, the Boys in the Band. Okay. Because after 11 years in working in New York uh, and, uh, and working in a restaurant for my food uh, and uh, getting, you know, doing working in Shakespeare in the summer uh, for, for Arthur Lithgow, who was John's father. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my idol, by the way, was your dad. Oh, uh, why? Yeah, Bob Pellenstein, because... My professor at, at, at the University of Arkansas had taught him in Iowa, the University mm -hmm. of Iowa, and oh, thought that he was one of the best actors he had ever seen. Oh my gosh. And so I've watched your father too. 
And uh, anyway, I, uh, I, uh, I got to uh, 11 years of work, uh, always achieving a little bit more, not, uh, 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 I guess, not fame, but you know, being known in the in in the in the, uh, in the in the process of becoming an actor in New York. And after that, uh, one day, this kid that I had met at Catholic University, uh, Mark Crowley, uh, showed up from Hollywood with this script and is holding it like a baby and asking me, please, would I read it? Uh, because no one else would. And uh, people had turned him down all over New York. He had written a play about nine gay men at a birthday party. And I read it and I thought it was funny. And he was my close friend, my pal from, from uh, graduate school. And I said, I'll do it. And he almost cried, but Mark never cried. He just took it away. And he said, thank you. And then I, I tried to talk him into playing the lead. No. Uh, then the smart ass guy, no. What part do you have in mind for me? And he said, Hank. And I said, Hank. Hank was the square guy who gave a cardigan in a gay birthday party to the birthday boy. And I said, oh, all right. Well, that's how I strike you. OK, fine. I'll see what I can do with that. And it turned out that Hank was the emotional center of the play. And years and years, years later, just recently when they did the revival in New York, I wasn't going to go because I don't like that stuff, foo for all. And uh, my friend David Zippel said, who's a lyricist of great fame, said, uh, you have to go. And I said, why? And he said, because of all the, the guys in your, in your cast who died. You have to represent them because you're the one left. And I, I, there were two of us left, uh, Peter White and me and Mart. And uh, so I realized uh, that my effect on people, and then David said, when I was a law student, I saw the movie that you did and I was wanting to come out, but I didn't know how. And I was, I was scared. But I saw you in that movie and I thought I can be like him because the, the part I had was the guy who taught, told the truth yeah. and was not afraid to, to had left a wife and two children to, because he had fallen in love with this guy. And I thought, well, this, is, this play was social justice. And as a, a young Catholic altar boy, social justice was very high on my my radar. I wanted to do something, like I said here, to, to, to stand tall, to, to matter. And social justice matters. And as we see uh, constantly today. So ba Boys in the Band put me on the map. Yeah, yeah. So that and was... In, instead of wrecking my career, as I was told, it yeah. put me on the map. That's great. And what a courageous choice to make because this was 1970, right? It was, it was 1967. 67, so even more so then to, to be, a, I mean, being homosexual wasn't an accepted thing at that time. No, the closet door was shut and, and people were re, reacting the way anybody caged reacts, right. you know, very large reactions emotionally. Right. And uh, so that uh, actually, maybe I had courage but I don't think I did have courage. I think I had, uh, had something far less because I think the men who came out and exposed themselves as gay in that play right. uh, really had courage. Right. So then and you did the movie. The movie was a couple of years later? The movie, yeah, it was a three-year engagement, the whole thing. Okay. Two years with the play, right. first in, in New York, in the workshop, then in the off-Broadway, and then we went to London with it. And we came back from London immediately went into shooting the movie, which opened in 1970. I have to go back and watch it again because I haven't seen it since the 70s. It's a, it's a very good movie. And Billy, Billy Friedkin did the, yeah, did okay. the movie. I didn't yeah. remember that. Yeah. Yeah, Billy is a great director and a fine, fine work he did. 
Well, I hate to say this, but so that was 50 years ago. Yeah. So in the, in the 50 years that came after that, were there other experiences you had that had that kind of profound effect on you either as an artist or as a person? Was there one or two things you can point to and go, this had a different kind of satisfaction, but one that was maybe equally as important? You know, I, I struggled with a lot of different uh, fears uh, all my life. And uh, uh, I, was, I had great stage fright. Uh, constantly. I don't know why exactly, uh, but it really affected me. And I remember doing the shadow box mm. uh, in New York right. back there, uh, in 1978, I believe it was. And uh, uh, I was so scared because even though it was the third production that we had done with Gordon Davidson, uh, uh, I never got over this terrible fright because I was playing again, a gay man. And uh, Mandy Patinkin was my lover. Uh, so it's quite, there's a little story there, but uh, uh, I remember walking, walking out onto the stage on any stage of the three productions that we did, absolutely stark terror, because I was gonna talk only to a voice at the back of the theater, who was the psychiatrist or whoever's talking to, because we were all condemned. We were all in hospice dying of cancer, each, each group of us. There were, there were three groups. And uh, I, we were the central group. And I remember talking so fast when I came out there because somehow you have a belief when, you're, when you walk out and you're scared that if you talk fast, you'll get through it, you know? And I was going a mile a minute. And I got nominated for a Tony for that performance. And I think it was because I never let up, you know, not even the second I was talking like this all the time. Certainly <laughs> on the tongue. Yeah. And it was, I could have told them it was sheer terror, you know. Uh, but, but then uh, uh, came uh, the beginnings of, uh, you know, some, so many plays. Gosh, I've done lots and lots of stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, then came uh, my first uh, experience in Hollywood. I was playing uh, uh, Dr. Prentice in uh, What the Butler Saw at the McAlphin Theater in New York. And all gone, everything's gone, <laughs> you know, Joe Orton's gone. Um, and uh, I took a leave from the play to go to do Bonanza in Hollywood. And I thought, this is great stuff. What am I doing in Bonanza? And I realized that I had been picked out by the producer, David Dortort, who was an old radical and suited my temperament so to a T. It was amazing because when I got to the, the set at Universal, I guess it was, I, I don't remember the studio, uh, but uh, I walked in and they, had, they laid out a cowboy's outfit for this character I was supposed to be playing. And uh, I was supposed to be a smart ass reporter from San Francisco who had discovered something about this character who was supposed, Dean Jagger was playing that part. And uh, uh, he was supposed to be good and the Bonanza boys were supporting him for governor and I was there to nail him, you know? And I said, this is wrong. And the, the, uh, the wardrobe guys, I don't know, you know Hollywood, they yeah. looked at me like, oh, he's one of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So the lead guy went, he didn't even answer me. He went straight to the red phone, picked it up. I thought, oh, I'm in trouble now. He said, yeah, yeah, but so, 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 so. put on the phone. And in two seconds, it seemed like a minute, Dortort walked in to the wardrobe and he said, what's up, Larry? And I said, oh, these guys uh, want me to wear this. And this is like, I look like a cowpoke. And he said, what would you like to wear? And I said, I'd like to wear something San Francisco. I'd like a derby hat. I'd like a, a green flashy vest. I'd like a, a, a foulard tie and, and no boots, no boots. <laughs> and he said, you know, this guy's absolutely right. Give him what he wants. <laughs> so, it usually work that way in TV, does no, it? No, it does not. <laughs> it does not. And then, uh, and then uh, I, I did... I don't know, 30 television films. Right. Uh, some of them really good, some of them to pay for the patio. Right. You know, 
And uh, patios are important too. They the patios are important. Uh, the swimming pool, kicking it, you know. But that's the Hollywood life, and I had never experienced that ever because I'm I was a New York guy by then. You know, I was ready. I didn't want any of that stuff actually, but once you're in it, you you start going for it. Yeah. But uh, Bob Brustein called me, Robert Brustein. He had started the American Repertory Theater in, uh, in Boston at Harvard. And he wanted me to be a member of the company and to come and play Danton in Danton's Death. And uh, I said, I can't because I have to do the Mary Tyler Moore show. <laughs> and he's, he scored me. He, talk about mentors. Brustein yeah. was a mentor. All these people were mentors along the way. My aunt, who didn't like me, who gave me the book, right. you know, and, and, and of course, the great professor, the professors that I had to teach me acting. Right. And uh, anyway, Bruce Stein, she said, you're a coward. You're a fool. You're out there doing, you're, you're trying, trying to earn money for the swimming pool, aren't you? He nailed me. Yeah. And I, I said, but I have a, a kid. I have a wife. I, I can't do it. Bob, and he slammed the phone down on me, uh, and that shook me. So I went back to New York, <laughs> and uh, and and then uh, we came back to Hollywood. I met Lucy. I went uh, doing Chapter Two, Neil Simon, right. and she was doing her playing our song, Neil Simon, right. and we were four blocks apart, right. and we met at Joe Allen's. Right. She told and, me uh, when I spoke to her about you walking in the door. With the lead. Oh, yes, yes. She describes that and makes it funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything with the kitchen sink, you know, blew in with me. Right. <clears throat> but I looked at this woman. I did not know her, and I had never, ever seen an I Love Lucy show. I looked at this woman, and something happened. Maybe you know the story yourself. You look at someone, and you know that's the person. And it was, I still can't find the words, even though I've written this scene many times in this little memoir I'm doing. I can't find the exact right words to describe it, other than it was, it was, un, it was electrical, it was cosmic, and something really drew us to each other. And all the more so when she found out I'd never seen one of her parents' shows, right. because she knew that I was interested in her. I was not at all interested in, you know, I love Lucy or that kind of fluff. Right, right. <laughs> that kind of genius, genius fluff. And it's lasted a little while, hasn't it? It's lasted 40 years. That's awesome. So and, one, more, one and, more thing I want to ask you about real quick is because we started with it, is your one person plays. Oh, yes. How, how did you start to write one person plays and what made you think that that was something you would be, I mean, you just talked about having stage fright, walking out yeah. by yourself when there's no one to help you. I mean, that's got to be its own kind of stage fright, right? It's interesting because it wasn't. Oh, interesting. Why? Uh, here's the thing. Uh, it was 1986. Uh, Lucy and I had an office above the equity offices on 46th Street. Uh, and it was Christmas, almost Christmas. And... Uh, I was looking out the window and I had been completely unemployed for a year. And uh, I'm looking at the, the smoke rising from the street across the Peter Max sign and uh, I'm like in despair. And I said to Lucy, I, I just, I can't stand this anymore. I don't want to be an actor anymore. I can't, I can't do this anymore. This is crap. And so as she said, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and the phone rang. And it was David Susskind. Now, your folks may not know David Susskind, but he was a great producer. And he happened to have been Lucille Ball's agent at one point, uh, which is not germane to this, but he called me very often and told me he had something for me. Some, because when we did Boys in the Band, he had a show called Open End on PBS, on WNET in New York. And on that, he talked about all kinds of sacred cow subjects that people did not want to talk about. And he invited the boys in the band to come on. And three or four of us said yes. And none of the other guys would open up. They, I don't know what they thought they were going to 
or that David was going to ask because he was very probing. Yeah. And I, as the one of the two straight guys in the play, I didn't have that fear. So I spoke up about the rights that we owed to all kinds of people, not, not just straight people, but gay people and black people and brown people, all that kind of stuff of talk about social justice. And he took a shine to me. So he would call me every so often and offer me some piece of crap. And I would always say no. And he'd always say, why? You're unemployed, aren't you? And it was always true. <laughs> so he called me at Christmas. And he said, uh, you're going to play Lyndon Johnson for me. And I want you in Toronto uh, in four day, five days. And I said, what? What are you talking about? And he said, there's a script coming for you. And uh, I want you to call me as soon as you get it. And you've read it. And uh, five, ten minutes later, a script arrived, 69 pages, single-spaced, Lyndon Johnson talking. And I looked at it, and I read a page, and I took it to Lucy's desk and dropped it there, and I said, read this. Uh, this is crazy. Huh? And she read, speed read, three pages or four pages, and she came back and dropped it on my desk. And she said, well, I guess if you don't do this, you don't want to be an actor. <laughs> and so I zipped up my fly <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll, I'll read it. So I read it and he called me in the middle of it and he said, okay, I want you, I want you at, in Toronto. And I said, no, no, I, I'm not doing this. And he said, yes, you are. And I said, who dropped out? And he said, it's none of your fucking business. <laughs> it was Jack Klugman. Because <laughs> Jack, Jack had the throat thing. Right. Well, not only that, I, I, a good thing because... I, yeah, I, he wasn't the right guy for it. Right. Clubbing. And I wasn't either. I, and I said to Susskind, I said, I'm not six feet five. Right. I'm not a, a dirty Southern politician. I hate, to, hate him. I tried, to, I tried to get him out of office in 68. We tried to levitate the Pentagon. I'm with Norman Mailer. <laughs> and he said, I, I, and I hate the son of a bitch is what I said. And there was a long pause. And David said very quietly, that will change, Larry. I said, okay, I'm coming up to your office now with the script. I'm going to prove to you that I'm not right for this part. And I did. I walked up Madison Avenue until I got to his office. And he had this wonderful secretary, Jean Kennedy. And as I walked in the office, she said, she said oh, Larry, we're so glad you're going to do this. <laughs> I said, this is psy war, psychological warfare. <laughs> so I went in and I sat down knee to knee with David and I said, I'm gonna prove to you that I'm not right. And I began to read the script in front of him. And a strange thing happened, David, this is a real thing. As I read it, I began to hear my father's voice because my father ran a store in Harrison, Arkansas on the square. It was like, all-purpose hardware and furniture and everything you want store and he used to sell Saturday was the big day and he would play cowboy songs outside on the tannoy and I was a little kid 12 years old but I would hang out and listen to the farmers whittling and talking about whether or not they could afford anything in that store and inside was my dad talking up a storm he was an honest man and he would he was an alcoholic, but he was a, a guy that told the truth. And he talked, and these guys talked to him, and I listened. And I heard that intonation. It, this was Arkansas. He had born, been born in Oklahoma. We had lived in Texas. And I heard that sound coming out of me from memory. And I just started to cry. And David said, well, I guess you're doing the part. And I took it. Yeah. And we went up to Canada, Canada and we shot the thing in a, like two, two weeks. And uh, it was just me and Charlie Jarrett, who was a director who had got an Oscar for Anne of the Thousand Days. Oh. And Charlie would walk in front of me while we rehearsed. Would walk in front, he would walk in front of me backwards, being the camera. And I would walk as Lyndon through the various parts of the, of the set. And uh, one day David came in and listened 
for a few minutes and I looked at the scowl on his face and I stopped and Charlie said, what's wrong, David? He said, Lyndon Johnson would eat this room. I said, you, you need it bigger. He said, yeah. And he told a story about how when he was with a bunch of producers, they're trying to get something from the White House and the door to the Oval Office opened and this huge man stormed out and brushed David to the, to the wall in his insistence to get, a, get straight through the hallway, like they were nothing. And, you know, David was not a tall man. And he was not a, but he was a mentor. He was an enormous mentor. And uh, so I did the play, I did the thing, and uh, got nominated for an Emmy. And uh, uh, David danced the horror for me. It's, <laughs> In his office, he said, we're going to win an Emmy. And my, he let my mother see the rough cut. And I, he said, at first he said, I don't think so. And I said, she's my mother. She's from Arkansas. How is she going to get the word out that it's terrible? <laughs> and he, but it wasn't terrible. It was a very good thing. Well, I'm going to go find oh, it. That started me. Yeah, I've never seen that. I've got to go find it and watch it. Yes, you can get the NET version. Okay. Probably, and you can get my own version if you just look at my website, which is lawrenceluckerville.com. It's all there, and you can watch it. Fantastic. Um, but what happens then when you're doing a one-man show is you are totally in control. And I rewrote the script because David told me to, because it was way, way too long. And uh, Jim Prideau wrote the original script, and I, I added to it and fixed the, uh, the opening the middle and the end. So I began to feel like it was my script, but it wasn't my script. Uh, he wrote it, but uh, I learned the ropes of writing one-man shows from that one because it was well done. And the additions that I had made were, uh, at one point, Jimmy Prideau came to West Point where I was doing it for the cadets. And uh, he said, well, whose who script is this? And I said, well, it's yours. And he said, well, why are there three jokes at the beginning? And I said, well, Jimmy, I've been playing this play for now for some time on the road and in Texas. And people hate Lyndon. Some people hate Lyndon. So I figured I'd better make them like Lyndon with some jokes before we get into the stuff of the Vietnam War. So I learned that and about... A, li a, a little, year, Mary Pop, little Mary Poppins there. What? A little spoonful of sugar helping the medicine go down. A little Mary Poppins. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, a spoonful of sugar. Yeah. If you could make them laugh. That's right. Know, we Democrats are, I believe, <laughs> the party of the heart. <laughs> it's a great show. And I, we toured it all over the place. Then we did it in New York. And, uh, and then... Uh, we're out doing it, and uh, some people from the Republic of Boulder, color uh, called and asked if uh, I would uh, do it for Eugene McCarthy. And I said, oh, no, you don't want Lyndon Johnson for Eugene McCarthy. They were deadly enemies. He ran against him. And they said, no, we, we do. And so I said, well, what if I give you, I find a counter counter to that and I, I write a new play for you and they said well that's fine but we want you to do Lyndon so my producer at the time Don Buford said let's let's find a, a, a liberal and so we came up with Clarence Darrow yeah. who was not a liberal he was a humanist yeah. he was better than a liberal right. and so I wrote my own Clarence Darrow show from I Got the Rights to His Life. And I wrote that play completely myself and, and w with Clarence. <laughs> because his sum summations at, in the trials were poetry. They were Shakespeare. Yeah. They're so beautiful. And he did them without notes. And 12 hours he spoke without notes. Larry, I could go on with you all day here, but I'm going to cut us off because I'm trying to keep these in a really good format for people to watch. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe as, as we continue to do these, 
It might be fun to do one later on with you and Lucy. Okay, that would be good. Which would be really fun. But this was awesome. Thank you for sharing this with my audience. There, this is this is great stuff. And thank you. I knew it was. I knew I was running long because I always do. Well, you know what? You have a lot to say, and it's really good stuff. So it's worth it. All right. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. See you later.